So uh, my name is Jackie Cates. I am the Senior Family Services Counselor at Gift of Life Donor Program. And myself and my department have the privilege of working with donor families after they lose their loved one. And we also get to connect with a lot of grateful recipients through programs such as this, as well as reading correspondence between donor families and recipients. Uh, so I anticipate there may be some questions about that. And we, we do have a webinar that talks about writing that we can send you the link to after. Um, and that will lead us to today's presentation, which is Survivor's Guilt, a Transplant Recipient's Perspective. So I just thought it would be a great time to welcome you to share what your understanding of survivor's guilt is uh, in the chat. So uh, if you believe you know what survivor's guilt is, please go ahead and, and share your thoughts and your comments. Okay, I'm gonna give it another few seconds before I go ahead and provide that answer. Okay, here we go, here's some. Feeling guilty that you get to survive when the donor dies. It's very difficult to explain. Um, this awful, grateful feeling of being alive, but confused why they had to leave. My guilt comes from someone else having to die for me to live. Okay, so thank you everybody who took the time to answer those questions. Um, and some of, some of the expressions that were shared, I definitely wanna address further and later in this presentation because I think there are some really um, important key terms and language that can help us cope better um, and healthier with our survivor's guilt. So survivor's guilt is a phenomenon that occurs when we survive a really intense traumatic experience and someone else has not. Um, there we go. So a condition of persistent mental and emotional stress experienced by someone who has survived an incident which others have died. So some of the questions that we may ask ourselves are, why me? Why did I survive? Or why not me? Why wasn't it me that, that died and the other person lived? Um, why did I survive when others did not? So these are some of the expressions that I did see in the chat box. So you guys did an amazing job at capturing those definitions. All right, um, so survivor's guilt really came to our language shortly after the Holocaust. And there are many individuals that describe feeling guilty that they were alive when their loved ones did not survive. Um, it came more into our current language and conversation really after 9-11. A lot of the first responders indicated that they, they experienced survivor's guilt. A lot of the other employees that were in the towers experienced survivor's guilt. And that's really when our research and explanation and ex exploration began uh, to learn more about this experience. So I wanted to share a, a post with you. And this was posted on the Donate Life America Facebook page in March of 2016 and is still so very relevant. Um, so this is a post who, uh, a recipient who received a heart transplant and had been waiting on the list for a second heart transplant. I feel guilty every time I remember that I'm waiting for a new hero heart. I feel guilty that I'm anxious when you, my organ donor, have given me so much already. I feel guilty that I couldn't keep you near until my hair was gray and I had laugh lines and wrinkles. In the midst of my immense gratitude, I feel guilty. I promise that I've taken good care of you. I've done everything just as the doctor said to, and then even more to protect you. 
Um, and she goes on to share this beautiful, beautiful post. But I, I wanted to highlight two pieces. So I feel guilty every time I remember that I'm waiting for a new hero heart. And in the midst of my immense gratitude, I feel guilty. So this really captures the vacillating emotions and the extreme gratitude, but also the really difficult feelings of, of guilt simultaneously. So survivor's guilt is not just related to transplant, but there are some very important post-transplant challenges that are unique to this population. So one may be not feeling worthy of the gift. Um, why did I receive this gift when the person next to me in clinic did not? Uh, why did I get this kidney when my friend is still on dialysis? There may be expectations of feeling like you have to have a speedy recovery and it has to look a certain way and there's no blips in the road. Um, when in reality, there may be some medical complications or graph failure and, and that may complicate feelings of survivor's guilt, like you are letting your donor down or your donor family down. And there's this extra pressure to feel like you are a good enough steward for these gifts. Uh, so these are some unique challenges that uh, you may have faced or you may have faced or, or you may not have faced. This is different for every single person. Uh, so these are some other quotes of recipients that we have heard about survivor's guilt. It was something I struggled with for a long time and initially it prevented me from getting on the waiting list. I didn't want someone to die so I could live, especially knowing my donor would most likely die tragically and unexpectedly. I prayed to God that he could take me instead so my donor could keep living. I was very grateful and happy to receive the transplant and still very much feel that way. But I felt a lot of sorrow for the family that lost their loved one. I really didn't know how to feel and I felt guilty being happy. I felt thankful to be alive, but guilty because I got to live and my donor didn't. I also felt an overwhelming desire to give back as a way of showing my thanks and gratitude. I was not sure if I personally wanted to die or if someone else should die so I could live. I never had so many mixed emotions in my life. Uh, and here are some more posts that are on our Gift of Life donor program Facebook page. The overwhelming feeling of grief I carried for his donor and donor family was the only thing I was not prepared for. Every milestone we experienced was one that was taken from them. It's hard to explain as a recipient of a deceased donor's kidney, there is a level of guilt of not wanting to disappoint the donor's family of who you are. I often wonder if they aren't writing because they feel guilty or feel as though it might be hurtful from our family to hear from them. So this last one is from a mother of a donor. So um, I will touch on this later, but many donor families that we hear from are so worried that their loved ones recipients are experiencing survivor's guilt. And often they ask me how they can possibly convey in correspondence, how to assure their loved ones recipients that they have absolutely nothing to feel guilty about. So I will speak to that later. So I just want to get a sense, and I have a feeling I might already know, but of the 111 people who are in this space right now with us today, have you or your loved one or your patients or the person or yourself experienced survivor's guilt? Um, and you can say a simple yes or a simple no. <laughs> I see a hell yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, and I see some no's in here too. And I think it's really important for everyone to understand that this is unique for every single person and every is experience is unique. So if you are feeling survivor's guilt, that is normal. And if you're not feeling survivor's guilt, that is normal too. There is no right or wrong way to feel here. It's just how you are in the moment. So thank you all for um, being open and, and sharing whether this is something that has resonated with you. Okay, so if you are experiencing survivor's guilt or your loved one or your patient is experiencing survivor's guilt, what can you do to support yourself? Uh, the, first, the first step is really accept and embrace what you are feeling. Um, wishing your feelings away is not going to make them go away. And sometimes sitting with those difficult feelings and processing them and exploring them is going to be how you best understand them and move forward with them. Know that you're not alone. As you can see in this chat, there are so many people all across this country that are experiencing survivor skill in relation to their transplant. And there are great resources out there in your support system, in your transplant team, in the caregiver lifeline, and in the family house to validate these experiences. Know that you can have relief and appreciation at the same time, and they can coexist with your guilt. There can be both positive and negative feelings together in the same moment all the time. And that can feel very confusing, especially when they're on opposite sides of the spectrum. You can grieve your donor. Um, yes, someone did die here. Someone did not die for you to live, however. Um, it is incredibly important, and I will reiterate this again and again, that your donor was going to die, period. Um, and either they made that incredibly generous decision to say yes on their license, or their loved one did. Um, and that is a period. That is a very separate event from you getting your transplant. But that doesn't mean that you can't grieve this person and be able to process their loss and how that is connected to you and the second chance. Do something with your guilt. Uh, we have so many amazing volunteers that are transplant recipients, and they indicate that how they cope and process the guilt that they experience is really by giving back and giving back to the donation and transplant uh, community. And that's a way to really live out their second chance um, and show the appreciation to their donor. And I see someone here is um, offering an example of that. And Corinne lights a memorial candle on her lung versary to honor her donor. Uh, don't get stuck on the whys. And I, I realize this is so much easier said than done. Um, but the reality is we, we don't have the answers to the whys. But what we do have is the opportunity to embrace life and to live it in the way that you want to. Uh, you have the opportunity to do things that you probably weren't able to do before when you were waiting for a transplant or when, when you were really sick. Um, and what our donor families love to hear is that their loved ones recipients are getting to do and getting to experience all the beautiful things that life offers. So I heard almost all of these sentences in the chat when I asked if anybody here has experienced survivor's, uh, survivor's guilt. And it's really important that we start challenging some of these thoughts and reframing them so they feel less burdensome and more helpful. Someone died in order for me to live. Again, this is just not true. It's not, yes, someone did die 
Um, they did, and it is tragic, and and um, it is very normal to wish that that person didn't die. However, your donor did not die just so you could live. They were going to pass anyway in relation to the, the way that they were injured or the trauma that they experienced. And one of uh, the donor families that I used to work extensively with, uh, her son, Sean, died at a very young age following a bike accident. And she used to do a presentation with me and look every recipient there in the eye and say, listen, if it was up to me to decide between my son and you, no offense, but I would choose my son every day. Unfortunately, there was not a choice here. My son was going to die. However, he had the ability to be a hero and save lives. And what mother does not want their child to be a hero? My son died, period. My son was an organ donor, period. Um, so another way to think about this is that someone died and had the generosity to say yes so someone else could live. I don't wanna be a disappointment to them. So the donor families place no pressure or expectations on what their recipients are like. What they want you to be is to be you and to really re-engage in your life and live it the way you want to. Um, so instead of thinking, I don't want to be a disappointment to them, think, how can I not be a disappointment to myself? And how can I take the second chance and run with it? What am I supposed to do now with this second chance? Um, the answer to that would be, how am I going to live this to the, to the best and the greatest? And, and what different things can I do? Or what would I like to do with this opportunity? while waiting. I don't feel comfortable praying for somebody to die. You're not praying for somebody to die. What you're praying for is a compassionate family that says yes to donation or a compassionate person that made their end of life wishes known on their license as a legal gift document. Um, you're praying for somebody to say yes. You're not praying for somebody to die. And just to go back on what our donor families say to us, they reiterate over and over again how important their loved ones' recipients are to them. And knowing that their recipients get to achieve and experience things that their loved one was not able to, that brings them so much joy. Donor families also love to hear from their loved ones' recipients. Um, so if and when, you feel comfortable. Um, sending a letter to your donor family is absolutely a way to express your gratitude and indicate all of the things that you are doing with your second chances. Um, and what they wanna learn is what, who you are, um, what your name is, uh, if you feel comfortable, or all the different things that you're doing. And it doesn't have to be a grand gesture. It can be, I'm able to climb five stairs now without getting out of breath. Or I walked down the driveway today and I got the mail for the first time in four months. Uh, those are so incredibly important. And that's what our donor families love to hear. Okay, so at this point, I am going to stop babbling because I have a really, really um, important guest to, answer, uh, to, to introduce, um, and I think that he will be able to explain survivor's guilt from a more personal experience. Um, before I get him on the line, I am going to stop sharing my screen for a moment because I do want to play a clip for you. Um, and I am going to put the volume on really loud because I'm not sure um, how the sound is going to be to you guys. So bear with me for a moment, please.
Okay, so I'm pushing play now. If you could indicate in the chat box whether you hear okay, that would be wonderful. Jackie, I'm not hearing anything yet. Nope, can't, can't hear it. Okay. So um, we're going to send this out to you. Um, and I am going to have um, Peter come on. Uh, Peter Matthews is a amazing volunteer of Gift of Life that I've had the pleasure of doing similar presentations with multiple times. And he was a speaker for our Life and Legacy celebration two years ago at this point. Um, and he just does a beautiful job conveying what transplant has meant to him and his experience. Um, so Peter, I'd love to ask you to unmute yourself um, so I can uh, do some interview questions with you. Uh, could you could you please start by just uh, introducing yourself to to everybody who's in attendance today? Yeah, um, hi Jackie, hi everybody. Uh, yeah, Peter Peter Matthews, my name. Um, I'm an uh, Aussie uh, transplant, and um, uh, lived here for quite a while now. Dual citizen. Uh, I have. Um, a lovely family and some grandchildren that are just my pride and joy. Um, and uh, I, I was transplanted in uh, October uh, 17th. Okay. So in the narrative that unfortunately we, we weren't able to listen to, uh, you did mention experiencing survivor's guilt. So what was your understanding of survivor's guilt pre-transplant? Well, um, you know, not a lot. I'd read anecdotal accounts um, of people who had, had experienced it. Uh, I had not um, at all. So yeah, it was a it was a brand new phenomenon for me. What does survivor's guilt mean to you now? Uh, well, I think it, it's an individual um, feeling. It varies person to person. Uh, I think for some, and that number includes me, um, it doesn't go away. Um, it may diminish over time. I think probably for me between you know, year one and now I'm in year four, I think it's um, diminished some. Uh, you know, and I've worked out ways of coping with it, but um, it's still there today. Yeah. And in terms of um, it manifesting, mm -hmm. does it manifest in particular ways or at specific times? Uh, well, I think it's, it, to sort of to go back, um, uh, I'm sure others have had the same experience. Like transplant is, you know, amazingly traumatic. For your body but also for your mind i think and and in my case you know almost overnight mm -hmm. i went from you know death's door to um gosh what can i do with my life um it's not exactly a light switch but uh, i'm sure others have felt this way that you know the change the change is overnight and dramatic so that's a shock to your head to begin with and then mm -hmm. You know, you're on a ton of drugs and you're trying, uh, you know, liver is a tough one. Um, I had a tough recovery. Um, and so in the first year, um, I struggled with it a lot. Um, I had uh, sort of three words in my head pretty much all the time. Uh, why, uh, what, and when. And the why was, and everyone, a lot of people have said this, you know, why, why was I saved? You know, why, why ahead of um, so many other people? And, um, and, you know, obviously thoughts for the young, young person that um, helped save me. Um, and then the what is, uh, I'm not a particularly religious guy. I guess I'd call myself spiritual. And, 
you know, it's hard to not see a spiritual part to this. You think, geez, you know, um, I was saved, so what am I supposed to do? And I struggle with what um, just as much as I did why. Um, you know, what, what am I supposed to do with a brand new life is, is basically what I struggle with. And then the third is, you know, when? When, when will this be over if, if it ever will? And um, I'm a left brain guy, I'm, I'm a mathematics guy, I'm a software guy. And so um, I tried analytically to solve this puzzle or answer these questions. And the more I tried, the less progress I made. Um, and so now today, you know, I, it's funny, I think about it at funny, at crazy times, you know. I might be with my grandchildren and having a complete blast. And then when I leave, it, I think about it. Um, so it's kind of like a toothache, you know, sometimes it's okay, mm -hmm. sometimes it's not. Yeah. Or then uh, I hear about what happens to other people um, waiting transplant. And, and Jackie, I've, I mentioned this person to you previously. I, a good friend's sister was, Working with the Cleveland Clinic, she needed a lung transplant. I was, she was having, she was having some struggles there. I was, I was working with them to to shepherd them down to Philadelphia to go to um, University of Pennsylvania Hospital because they they do a lot of difficult cases there. And you know, this went on for months and months, and then um, just out of the blue, um, I heard she had died. Um, and that just floored me. Yeah. Um, it was tough, very tough. So, you know, I get, I get little subtle uh, reminders of it, and then I get, you know, broadsides where I get hit on the side of the head with a piece of two by four. Yeah, I think there's, you know, there's grief in this and grief is not always on all the time. It, it vacillates. Um, and it, you know, it, it sounds like that's that's something that's happening with your survivor's guilt. Sometimes it's very present in your mind and other times it feeds to the back. And I think that's that's absolutely normal, um, whatever normal means, right? Yeah, and then, you know, for me, for me, the, the guilt sort of comes from two sources, really. One is, um, well, the easy one <laughs> to describe. The easy one is uh, I was um, I, I got so sick so quickly that I sped to the head of the line um, in the hospital and uh, I know I jumped over people that had been waiting um, and in Australia if you if you're a queue jumper it's it's uh, almost a capital crime. Um, you just don't jump the line. And so I struggled a lot with the fact that I know a lot of people, um, you know, maybe they lived, maybe they didn't, but I was treated ahead of them. And the doctor said to me, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be kind to yourself here because you know, what, what did you want us to do? Let you die? And okay, that clinically makes sense, but men, you know, emotionally doesn't. And then the second is for the, for the young man, um, I know he was in his 20s and I can listen to you, Jackie, and you. <laughs> I can listen to you say, uh, no one else died to save me, um, or words to that effect. And, you know, I know that uh, his, his death and my life um, coming back are completely independent events. I mean, as a mathematician, I know that. I didn't know him, I had no hand in his death. But yet if I put my hand under my rib cage on my right, um, he's right there. Uh, I can't separate his death from my life. They're disconnected. Even though I, <laughs> I didn't know him and I had no hand in his death, um, I still feel I'm connected to his death, which, you know, that adds to, you know, your feelings of um, uh, a little bit of regret. And then you wonder, or at least I do, I wonder what his life might've been. 
Um, and what I should do, you know, in response. So I'm rambling a bit, but those are the two places my guilt comes from. Um, no, you're not rambling at all. And I, I think it's very important to notice and to acknowledge that, yes, you and your donor are connected and, and you are connected in a very unique way. Um, and I think there is a way to embrace that and validate that without without the firm belief that they died for you to live. And I, I so recognize that it's so easy for me to sit here and say that. Um, and it's different than saying it and experiencing it. Um, but I, I think that's where really trying to challenge yourself and, and to engage in reframing those thoughts when you're feeling that way. Well, I've... I don't know. I mean, my reason for speaking today is to maybe help people because um, I think I've worked out a way to um, cope with it. Like I said, it doesn't go away. Um, like I, um, this might sound surreal, uh, but I talk with the kid um, and I sometimes think, I sometimes think he talks back. So I've tried to establish a relationship with him because, you know, we walk around together, we go everywhere together. He's gonna grow old with me. Um, and then directly in terms of what I've done is I thought, well, I'm applying, I'm spending all of this energy on solving, trying to solve the problem, why, what, when. And it suddenly struck me, I don't know what year, but it struck me that I, I was just completely wasting my time, that there were no answers for that. So I, I, I said, I got to redirect the energy. So I redirected in two places. Um, one is um, uh, purpose. I try to find um, good things to do that the kid would be proud of. Uh, and then, I look at um, gratitude. So there's, you know, I try to live with purpose and I try to live with gratitude. And I, I found out I'm very goal, goal oriented guy. I have to, I can't just say I'm grateful and I can't just say I live with purpose. I've actually got to act it out. So when I act it out and put energy into it um, and, you know, help people directly or speak like this or, and I got to tell you, before the transplant, I, I may not have been um, as open as I am now because, um, you know, it's difficult sometimes to tell stuff that's inside your head. Um, anyway, but now uh, I, I try every day, actually, to do something, um, some action, that shows I'm grateful and some action that shows my purpose. And, and that way I've been able to take the negative energy that I was wasting and put it onto something more valuable. And that, that's what I've done. And so far it's working, so I'm gonna stick with it. And it absolutely, you know, I, I can't testify to how it's been working for you, but we see it at Gift of Life every single day, Peter, your gratitude, your genuineness, and all of the things that you do on a daily basis to live your life to the fullest and also ensure that your donor is right there with you in every step that you take. And I think that's incredibly, incredibly special. Um, and I, I do see from the chat how meaningful your words and your experiences have been uh, just in terms of how validating they are and how they match a lot of what people are feeling in this room. Um, I see thanks for articulating with what we struggle with. Thank you for your vulnerability. We appreciate your honesty and courage to share your thoughts. Um, thank you for sharing your deep personal story. 
Uh, so I, I echo all of those sentiments. I think there's no better way to explore survivor's guilt than through the perspective, experience, and words of a transplant recipient. Um, so I, I did, before we, we leave space for questions, Peter, I was wondering um, if you wanted to share you know, something particularly special that, that you're doing in honor of your donor and, and for you. Well, um, I'm putting you on the spot here, so <laughs> you are. I mean, I've, I've decided that I could be. I decided I could be the most helpful for people if I showed that I have, you know, complete sort of transparency. And so I've seen a couple of comments that, uh, yeah, it does make you feel a bit vulnerable, um, and I've felt that. But I feel. Um, as if that makes me unpleasant or gives me an unpleasant feeling, you know, maybe that means I'm being authentic and helping some people. Um, the other thing I'm doing, which is um, maybe you're <laughs> hinting about, is um, I had a really, really tough time um, with my recovery. It was, uh, it was a very long time, um, about 11 weeks. And um, some days I just, uh, I, I wasn't quite sure how to get to the next next day. Um, so I sort of set myself a goal, which was if I, if I get out of here, um, I'm gonna go um, hike a big mountain, um, the biggest one I can hike. And so I decided um, in early 2000, uh, well actually late 2017, still in the hospital, I said, all right, I'm gonna hike Kilimanjaro. And it sort of gave me some, I mean, I had my family to hang on to, of course, but um, I wanted something real and tangible. So I hung on to that and every day sort of helped pull me, pull me forward. And so damn it all, I'm going to go do it. Um, but at the end of this month, I fly over there and um, come hell or high water, I'm, I'm climbing to the top of that mountain. Um, and... When I, when I stand up there, I'm gonna, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I thought I had this, but um, I don't. I mean, when I, stand, when, I, when I stand up there, I'm gonna hold my hands up and I'm, I'm gonna say, so kid, how's the view? We made it. Yeah. And then, um, as well as saying thank you to him, maybe I can speak to all of the people that are struggling and waiting and waiting and waiting, frustration, setbacks, fear, um, fighting all of those emotions, maybe I can show them that there's a chance and that they should find an ounce or half an ounce or a tenth of an ounce of hope and just hang on to it. Um, yeah, so that, that's what I'm gonna do. Thank you so much for sharing, Peter. And I, I do want to remind you that just because you're expressing emotions doesn't mean that you don't have it together. You have it more than together. And I think it's beautiful that you are able to express how you're feeling in that way and be yourself, your genuine self with 114 other people. So I, I really, I really appreciate your willingness to be present and here with us today and uh, just share your, share your perspective and share everything and how this has been for you. Well, um, everyone on July 4th is going to be uh, maybe uh, having a beer and some hot dogs, hamburgers and trying to stay cool. And that's the day I'll be standing up there. It'll be zero degrees. So I'll have three or four layers on. <laughs> So if everybody wants to um, turn to the southeast and wave and I'll wave back. Yeah. 
So I, I do want to leave time for questions because uh, I, I do think that there, there could be quite a few. And I, I do see um, a few comments that I also love to read out loud. Um, but I see, um, let's see. So a lot of amazing comments to you, Peter. Um, a few people are curious whether you are um, keeping a blog <laughs> and they'd like to see pictures and follow your story. Um, let's see, I do, I wanna make sure I'm not missing any questions. Um, Through, see if anybody has any particular questions about your experience or survivor's guilt. Um, yeah, there is one question in the Q&A that I see um, from Martha that says, I wrote a thank you letter after my transplant, had the transplant in 2017, have not heard anything from the donor family. Did this happen often? Mm -hmm. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, reply, and I see that's from Martha, I'm going to reply to you my email um, so we can chat, um, because there is a, a, a really um, awesome session that we talk about the writing and correspondence uh, process, and um, that is, you know, something that does happen, but I, I do want to leave time for particular questions about survivor's guilt. Um, so I'll also leave my email in this chat. So if anybody has questions about writing, um, please feel free to, to send me an email. Um. I see that someone climbed Mount Kilimanjaro against their doctor's advice. <laughs> I'm glad you were safe and and um, climbed it successfully. Uh, does does anybody have any questions about survivor's guilt or any questions uh, more specifically for Peter and and how he copes um, and and moves through? Um, here's a here's a really awesome question um, for Peter. What are some of the things that people say to you to try and comfort you when you're struggling with survivor's guilt that are not helpful? Oh, good question. Yeah. Um, well, for better or worse, um, I've kept it to myself, except you all know now. <laughs> um, I, I don't talk about it much with, with um, family and friends, to be honest. Um, but let's say I did, and someone said to me, uh, you know, get over it. Uh, I might be inclined to punch him in the nose um, because, um, you know, it's, it, it, if you're a, if you're a um, caregiver for someone who's been through transplant, I mean, you have to just accept that this is a real phenomenon and it's affecting the person. And you've got to be as supportive as you can, acknowledging that it's there. And, you know, as for me, trying to redirect energy. Um, anyway, that, that's how I'd answer that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that another, another portion may be to think about what would be helpful for you to hear. Um, and when there are people in your life who continue to say the unhelpful things, providing education, uh, you know, that's not helpful. And it's not, it's not offering me any comfort. Uh, if you're trying to support me, here are some ways that you can do so. Uh, yeah, Jack, sometimes, oh, sorry, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, Jackie, just occurs to me because, uh, you know, am I worthy, um, I think is a question a lot of um, trans, I call them transplanters, by the way. I'm a transplanter. Um, I think transplanters feel that a lot. Am I worthy? Um, am I doing what I, am I doing all I can with the life that was given me? And I think um, that's the sort of thing a caregiver can help with to, to provide validation that, hey, you know, you, you're living a worthy life. You're, you're, you know, living with purpose and you're appreciative, grateful. I think reinforcement like that can help. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I think on the same token, something that I'm seeing um, in the chat is not just feeling survivor's guilt in relation to the donor, but also survivor's guilt in relation to other transplant recipients. Um, and I, I know that's something, Peter, that you mentioned briefly, that you were, you were a line skipper and, and um, what your feelings were about that. So do you have, do you have any advice for um, individuals experiencing survivor skill in that realm? You know, I haven't come up, I honestly haven't come up with something that satisfies me there because, you know, the numbers, I, I know a lot about liver transplantation. There's, there's about 30 done each day across the U.S., um, but there's still a ton of people waiting and, and there are people that die and, and it's heartbreaking. And I haven't come to grips with the fact that I personally know that there were people that in the hospital that I got transplanted before. And, you know, it's tough to come to grips with. I, I have not yet. I think all I can do is try and, you know, mm -hmm. do the damn best I can. And that's the only, only thing I can do, really. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think it's important to acknowledge the other side of the spectrum. You know, there are absolutely individuals that are in here that haven't experienced survivor's guilt. And that's okay. Um, it's okay to experience survivor's guilt and it's also normal not to. Um, and I think it's important to, you know, maybe um, tap into that as a way to get support. Um, and learn from uh, these, these individuals, if they're willing to share in the chat. Um, one person said they waited for eight and a half years for their second chance. Um, and that's an incredibly long time. And uh, to get that second chance and run with it is, is amazing. Um, let's see. I see that someone says uh, we all, quietly suffer from survivor's guilt, thinking no one will understand. How can we begin to open up to our loved ones to get support? What can we say to help them understand? And I, I think the reality is no one, no one is 100% going to understand your experience. It's, it's the same thing when we lose someone we love. No one is going to 100% understand your grief. However, what they can do is, is work hard to hear you and, and work hard to offer you the space to process what you need to. Um, and asking how they can best support you. you know, Jackie, I had, a, I had a thought on that is, you know, I, I recall, you know, my five, my five kids and my wife standing around, you know, my bed and we didn't know from, you know, because of the speed with which I got ill, um, it was touch and go. And I, today, for instance, right, if I think of survivor's guilt and I look at, look at it from their perspective, you know, all they're happy about is that I'm alive. Um, it's, it, would be, it would be a big ask of me to get them to try and relate to uh, uh, what I feel just because they have a completely different perspective on it. Right. Yeah. But I think you're right. I mean, all you can do is say to them, hey, can you just listen? That's all. Please just listen. Mm -hmm. And maybe just talking about it. If you find someone who's willing to listen and you can talk, I think that helps. Absolutely. And also sometimes asking from your loved ones what you need. Um, you know, your, your loved ones have the best of intentions in supporting you. And, and this goes back to saying unhelpful things, um, really indicating that, that this is how you can best help me and support me. Um, I see a few more questions. I am going to be cognizant of our time. Um, if you do have to head out, um, please please feel free. Um, and if you want to stay on a little bit longer, um, please do. Um, I do see 
Um, one, is it better to not know anything about your donor? Um, I, I don't think it's it's better or worse not to know anything. I think it's it's just um, it it just is for lack of a, a better response. Uh, sometimes it can be helpful to know some information, and other times it can create more questions and more whys um, and and more feelings. And other times it's it's comforting. So it depends on the person. I think. Um, would you consider survivor's guilt to be a specific form of PTSD? Uh, so that's an interesting question. I think post-traumatic stress disorder is a DSM diagnosis, um, whereas survivor's guilt is more of a phenomenon and experience. Are there similarities? Absolutely. Uh, there's physiological similarities, there's emotional similarities, cognitive similarities. Um, but I, I, you know, it would be a case by case basis to say whether it is uh, PTSD or not. Um, and I'm going to go with one more question. Um, how to cope with big milestones, transplant anniversaries, et cetera. Um, oh, this is, this is offering suggestions, not a question, I'm sorry. Um, nope, I'm not sure, it's kind of both. Um, I began paying it forward in different ways on that day. I'm eight years out and that day is still very difficult. I find myself mourning my donor on this day and celebrating my blessed life. And I, I think this is a really, a really good point. Um, that these big days, these big milestones are sometimes days that are mixed with these different intense emotions. Um, and I'm curious if there is a way that you can honor your donor while simultaneously celebrating you and your life. And, and that's something to think about, you know, giving back or maybe um, having a special place where you can honor your donor, whether it's planting a tree or, um, you know, having a, a dedicated space in, in your life that you can go and, and talk to your donor, uh, just ways that you're able to navigate those, those special days in a way that feels true to yourself and validates what you should be celebrating. Um, because I think it's important to, to celebrate the second chance as well. Okay. Hey, Jackie, can I um, offer something? Um, yeah, please do. Um, I'm willing to um, talk with anybody. Uh, if um, someone wants to reach out to me, what, what do you suggest? Reach you first or give my email, what, what should we do? Um, so that, that is up to you, Peter. Um, if you want, if you feel um, comfortable, um, or I can provide my email and people can send their questions to me and I can forward them to you. Um, does, that, does that feel okay? Um, what the heck? Why don't I, I'll just put my email out here, right? You only live twice. You only live twice. Oh, okay. That's, that's that a, is. That's a pun. Um, <laughs> um, okay. Or, okay. There it is. Um, so there is Peter's email. Um, please feel free to email me with questions as well, whether it's regarding correspondent with the recipient or particular experiences that you have that you'd like uh, to, to get more support on or have questions about. Um, and Faith, any, any closing wrap up? Sure, um, I would just love to say thank you so much to everyone for participating and for being patient with our technical issues today. Um, however, Jackie and Peter, you did such a beautiful job um, even still um, on this very important topic. So thank you to everyone so much. Um, this was really wonderful. Um, again, you will be getting an email tomorrow with follow-up um, from today and evaluation and resources for upcoming webinars and opportunities.
Um, so thank you so much um, for being here and we hope that you all have a wonderful day. All right, thank you everyone. Bye.